A paradise beach turned into a death track for lovers. It is believed that an investigation on the heels of a crime is the most effective and often leads to success. The methodology itself implies immediate response, operational collection of evidence, and questioning of witnesses, which significantly increases the chances of quickly solving the case and holding the guilty accountable. However, if it is not possible to identify the perpetrator, the investigation can drag on for years and even decades until the criminal case is frozen and transferred to the archive after the statute of limitations expires. However, sometimes unsolved and seemingly hopeless investigations receive unexpected developments many years later, which helps to find the right lead and achieve results when no one believed it anymore. The case of Lindsay Cutshaw and Jason Allen, which had been gathering dust on the shelves for almost 15 years, is a prime example of this. At the time, it was not possible to solve it despite the operational actions of the investigative team and the high reward offered for any information. The main problem was the lack of motive for such a brutal act against the loving couple. In addition to this, it was not possible to find any witnesses, murder weapons, or any significant clues. It was a typical dead end, and no one hoped that the truth would ever be discovered. However, a decade and a half later, solving this case was helped by another brutal crime. It also turned out that at least four people knew what had happened, but all these years, they remained silent. Who were Lindsay Cutshaw and Jason Allen? Lindsay Cutshaw was born in the small town of White Eyes in Coshocton County, Ohio, in 1982. She grew up in a very religious family, and her father was a pastor of a Christian community. Despite a strict upbringing from childhood, she was very active, engaged in sports, and later became interested in hiking and extreme tourism. After finishing school, Lindsay became a student at Appalachian Bible College in West Virginia. During those years, she regularly climbed mountains of various difficulty levels, rafted down turbulent mountain rivers, and even organized hikes herself. The young woman dreamed of founding her own summer camp for children and teenagers, where she could teach them the basics of survival in the wild, rafting, tourism, and so on. Jason Allen was born in the city of Zeeland, in the American state of Michigan, in 1978. He also grew up in a deeply religious family and from a teenage age was seriously interested in hiking tours, mastering survival in the wild. The young man was tall, athletic, toned, possessed leadership qualities, and was able to find like-minded people to conquer new heights. The couple met in 2002 during a hiking trip in the Appalachians. At that time, Lindsay was still a student, while Jason worked as a mountain guide and climbing instructor. The young people immediately felt mutual sympathy, and just six months after their first meeting, the young man came to the girl's parents and asked for their daughter's hand in marriage. Her parents were not opposed and gave their blessing to the lovers. The young man's parents also approved of his choice after which the couple was officially engaged. Alan presented the young woman with a beautiful diamond ring for this occasion, which was soon to be complemented by another, an engagement ring. The young couple planned to get married in September 2004, had big plans for their future together, and wanted to buy their own large house where they could live comfortably and raise their children. Unfortunately, these plans were not meant to come true. The final trip, in the summer of 2004, Lindsay and Jason worked as senior counselors at a Christian summer camp called Rock N Water, located in El Dorado County, California. After their wedding, they planned to open their own similar camp, so they were gaining experience and learning the nuances of working with the younger generation. On the evening of Friday, August 14th of that year, the couple decided to take a weekend trip to the San Francisco area. They informed their colleagues of their plans in advance, leaving two of the most experienced counselors in charge of the camp. Lindsay and Jason promised to return by Monday, so their short journey was expected to cause no complications either for the couple or for their temporary replacements. They set off in a 1992 Red Ford Tempo, owned by Lindsay, and that was the last time anyone saw them alive. By Sunday evening, the counselors had not returned to the camp, but no alarm was raised then as everyone was confident that the couple would arrive either late at night or early Monday morning. However, 
when it was discovered after the morning roll call at 8 a.m. that Jason and Lindsay were still missing and their phones were unreachable, their colleagues decided to contact the police and also inform the missing couple's families about the situation. The parents, horrified upon hearing the news, rushed to the camp to learn more about the incident. Everyone knew that the couple was very responsible in their duties. They were never late, and if any unforeseen circumstances had occurred, they would have found a way to communicate that. The Challenging Search Upon arrival at the camp, law enforcement officials interviewed the couple's colleagues, and the investigation immediately encountered a serious problem. No one could precisely say where the young couple had gone. It was only known that they planned to explore around San Francisco, and given their great love for adventure and extreme leisure, they could be in the most remote corners where there was neither communication nor civilization. While the police waited the legally mandated two days during which the missing were expected to report themselves, relatives and friends decided not to just sit back, but to organize a search themselves. They called everyone they knew, trying to find out when the couple last made contact with anyone, distributed flyers with photos of the bride and groom, and requested anyone who might have seen them to respond immediately. By Tuesday, law enforcement had joined the search operation. The main search unfolded around San Francisco, its suburbs and surroundings. However, the area was vast, and it was simply not possible to thoroughly comb through it. Then, one of the friends noted that the couple loved the wild, rocky beaches that were always beautiful and secluded, prompting the police to focus on these areas. Bodies in sleeping bags. For several days, the search yielded no results, and the hope of finding the couple alive was diminishing rapidly. Then, on Wednesday, August 19th, a patrol helicopter flying over one of the rocky, wild beaches reported that two bodies were found in sleeping bags on the desolate coast, and it seemed unlikely they were just resting there. The first thing police encountered upon arriving at the scene was a red Ford Tempo parked on a cliff near a lookout point in a small shelter for tourists, from which a steep trail led directly to the scenic wild beach. The car was immediately checked in the database and found to belong to the missing student, Lindsay Cutshall. Descending the trail to the beach, law enforcement found two bright sleeping bags containing individuals. At first, it might have seemed they were merely sleeping, but no response came to calls or noise. Approaching closer, the officers saw that the sleeping bags contained a young man and woman, both showing no signs of life. A brief initial examination suggested that their lives had been taken by gunshot wounds to the head, and given the distinctive smell of decomposition, they had been there for more than a day. All the belongings of the deceased, including mobile phones and wallets containing bank cards and cash, were found beside them. Therefore, a robbery as the main motive was almost immediately ruled out. The keys to the parked car above were also visibly placed, ruling out car theft as a motive. Investigators immediately suspected that the deceased were the same young people who had gone missing last week near San Francisco. Their suspicion was confirmed by documents found nearby under the names Lindsay Cutshall and Jason Allen, but the bodies still needed to be identified by relatives. The arriving parents of the couple, who had hoped until the last that the remains belonged to someone else, were devastated by grief upon recognizing their children. Investigation and initial theories. Thus, theories involving robbery or an attempted carjacking were dismissed since all valuables, money and keys were left untouched in plain sight. Moreover, forensic analysis revealed no signs of physical assault or intimate assault on the bodies, except for the gunshot wounds to the head. It appeared that Lindsay and Jason were simply sleeping peacefully at the time of the incident and did not have a chance to react. They made no attempt to defend themselves, flee, or even get out of their sleeping bags. Everything pointed to a swift act that resembled an execution, or vendetta. But who could have taken the lives of two individuals in such a brutal manner and why? The questions multiplied, but no answers were forthcoming. There were no signs that anyone else had stayed in the area. The beach was quite secluded, and accessing it via the steep trail was challenging. Despite efforts, no shell casings were found nearby leading investigators to theorize that the shooter either took them or threw them into the ocean. The shots had been fired at close range into the heads of the sleeping tourists, 
indicated by specific traces, so the casings, if not deliberately moved, would have been nearby. Interestingly, the beach appeared quite clean, yet a few meters from where the sleeping bags with the bodies were found, an empty beer bottle lay. The deceased did not drink alcohol as they led a healthy lifestyle, suggesting the bottle might belong to the mysterious shooter. This particular brand of beer was rarely found in the area and likely came from a neighboring state. As no other clues were found, this bottle was considered a significant lead, although it was unclear whether it had any connection to the shooter or the crime. A theory was proposed that the deceased might have had a conflict with someone the day before the tragedy, and their opponent returned at night with a weapon to settle the score. Although Jason and Lindsay were very friendly with everyone, it was not excluded that they might have inadvertently displeased someone either in appearance or for some other reason. Additionally, the shooter could have been intoxicated or mentally unstable. From the bullets extracted from the victim's skulls, experts determined they were fired from a Marlin brand rifle, .45 caliber, model 1894, produced by Marlin Firearms Company. This was a rare weapon that might have been part of a collector's arsenal. Such models were typically used for hunting. This clue was significant for the ongoing investigation, but it remained the only one for the time being. Investigators speculated that the shooter was likely a male acting alone. He could have been a hunter, collector, or firearm enthusiast. The couple's route, search, and witness interviews. The investigation now aimed to establish the route the couple had taken, who they might have contacted, and when they were last seen alive. The first task presented few issues, as the couple had taken numerous photos, and their camera remained untouched among their personal belongings. Additionally, in the tourist cabin near the lookout point where they parked their car, there was a guest book where visitors could leave notes. The engaged couple had written a couple of entries expressing that it was one of the best weekends of their lives, filled with love, happiness, and the discovery of perhaps the most beautiful beach they had ever seen. It was discovered that on Saturday, the couple had stopped at a fishing pier about 20 miles from where their lives were ultimately taken. This was evidenced by the photographs they had taken there, prompting law enforcement to visit the area and speak with locals in search of potential witnesses. Many remembered the young couple traveling in a red car. They were looking for a place to stay overnight, but found no vacancies in any of the three nearby hotels. This was because August is peak tourist season in the area, and most travelers booked their accommodations well in advance. The couple then dined at a local restaurant, walked around the area, took several photos, and set off again in the evening. According to everyone who saw and interacted with them, they were friendly, engaged in no conflicts, and appeared happy and carefree. None of the witnesses could recall anything suspicious or unusual. Notably, the beach where the bodies were found was located in a protected area where camping was prohibited. However, since the young people could not find a place to stay overnight, they decided to settle on the beach, but chose not to set up a tent, instead using their sleeping bags. They believed that on a warm August night on a secluded beach, they faced no threats and planned to head back at dawn to return to the rock and water camp on Sunday as promised. This information helped narrow down the time frame during which the couple was likely taken from life. They went to sleep but did not survive until morning, indicating they were likely taken from life between 11 o'clock Saturday night and dawn on Sunday. The first suspect. Although the investigation into the double taking of life was in full swing and news broadcasts urged anyone with any relevant information to contact the police, law enforcement withheld certain details. In particular, the results of the ballistics analysis were kept secret to avoid alerting the suspect and prompting them to hastily dispose of the weapon used in the crime. Initially, suspicion fell on a local drifter who periodically slept on that very beach and had been seen nearby on the evening before the crime. The homeless man, mentioned by some witnesses, was quickly located, brought to the station, and interrogated. The 57-year-old suspect had no alibi for the night of the crime, However, his involvement could not be confirmed. The main reasons were the absence of the weapon used in the crime and the fact that his DNA did not match that found on the beer bottle discovered on the beach. A new phase of the investigation in 2006. For nearly two years, 
the investigation had been at a standstill with no clear direction on how to proceed. Then, in the spring of 2006, law enforcement decided to publicize the data they had on the weapon used in the crime and to reach out again to potential witnesses by offering a $50,000 reward for any useful information that could lead to the perpetrator. Following this announcement, about a thousand calls came in, but most did not aid the advancement of the investigation. However, law enforcement became interested in 26-year-old Sean Gallen, pointed out by several locals. According to them, the young man collected firearms and bladed weapons, behaved aggressively, was frequently involved in conflicts, threatened acts of violence, and occasionally damaged other people's property. Sean was arrested and questioned. He had previously been on the police's radar for brawling, hooliganism, and driving under the influence of alcohol and drugs. He indeed had an impressive collection of weapons, but the specific rifle in question was not among them. Verifying his alibi from two years prior proved impossible, and his DNA did not match the sample found on the beer bottle at the crime scene, so Gallen had to be released. A suspect from another country? Simultaneously, another suspicious and aggressive drifter came under scrutiny, often seen with a firearm, frightening the local residents. His name was Joseph Henry Burgess, and he was 61 years old at the time of the couple's demise. Burgess often ranted about receiving commands from God, it was discovered that in the late 1970s, Joseph lived in Canada, where he also wandered aimlessly. In 1978, he joined the commune of the Children of God, positioning himself as a deeply religious person, and according to those around him, he was quite the fanatic. He soon had a conflict with two young people that escalated into outright enmity, and a few weeks later, these individuals were found lifeless, each with several close-range gunshot wounds to the head. Notably, their bodies were also discovered on a beach in sleeping bags, seemingly taken while they slept. By the time the police arrived, Burgess had vanished. His guilt was proven through numerous left-behind clues, but he could not be convicted as he had fled to the USA, crossing the border illegally. He managed to evade capture for nearly a quarter of a century until the police connected him with the double homicide on a beach in California. However, they were unable to interrogate him as a shootout occurred during his apprehension, resulting in the deaths of a police sergeant and Burgess himself who opened fire. A fatal echo from the past. In the spring of 2017 in Forestville, California, a tragedy unfolded one night on March 14th. Gunshots rang out in the Gallen family home, prompting alarmed neighbors to immediately call the police. The victim was 35-year-old Seamus Gallen, and the perpetrator was his older brother, Sean. An argument had erupted between the siblings, during which Sean, under the influence of prohibited substances, grabbed a firearm and discharged three bullets into his younger brother. Police recognized the shooter's name as Sean had previously been detained as a suspect in the double homicide on a beach, but was released due to a lack of evidence. Since then, he had been in police sites twice for property damage and making threats, but had only received fines. It was also discovered that the detainee was an avid hunter and had a hobby of crafting knives and other bladed weapons. Those around him described him as antisocial, aggressive, and unpredictable. After taking his brother's life, Sean attempted to flee but was almost immediately apprehended. Law enforcement then decided to thoroughly reinvestigate this man's potential involvement in a couple's perpetration from 13 years prior. His personal social media page revealed much, where he posted pictures of his substantial weapon collection and discussed supposed telepathic and extrasensory abilities. According to his posts, he believed he was on a special mission, receiving assignments from space. This seemed like delusions of a disturbed mind, and police suspected Sean indeed had serious mental disorders. He stubbornly refused to cooperate with the investigation, spoke nonsensically, and insisted on his innocence. However, when detectives checked the personal messages on his deceased brother's page, they found something intriguing. Back in 2006, when a $50,000 reward was offered for information on the double homicide case, Sean's former girlfriend had messaged Seamus suggesting she could claim the reward by turning in her ex-boyfriend. They both knew everything but kept silent. Unfortunately, questioning either was no longer possible since the brother had been shot and the woman had died in a car accident two years earlier.
An unexpected confession. Initially, Sean denied any involvement and refused to speak, but when shown the printouts of the messages between his former girlfriend and his brother, he surprisingly confessed and began to give a detailed account. His narrative not only surprised, but shocked law enforcement. Despite more than 13 years passing since the double homicide, Gowan remembered the details of that night vividly. That evening, he had left his house with a Marlin rifle, intending to hunt in a wooded area. He aimlessly wandered for a couple of hours before descending a trail to a wild beach, which, he claimed, was a spot to encounter boars. As he walked along the shore, he spotted two bright sleeping bags. Approaching closer, he discovered a young man and woman sound asleep inside. He stood watching them for several minutes, then suddenly heard voices in his head commanding him to end their lives. Sean claimed this was the mission from space he could not ignore. He placed the barrel of his rifle almost against the young man's head and pulled the trigger. The sound woke the young woman, but before she could comprehend the situation, a second shot ended her life as well. He decided to collect the casings and carried them away in a beer can he had emptied while descending to the beach. Later, according to him, he tossed the can into some bushes in his father's backyard, where he went to give the rifle to his father and asked him to hide it. His elderly father asked no questions and simply buried the weapon in the dirt floor of the cellar in his old barn. Remarkably, Sean's claims were verified. The rifle was found at the site of the now-collapsed barn, and the beer can with the casing still rested in the overgrown bushes in the backyard. The fact that the murderer's father had passed away in 2009 and his property had since fallen into disrepair and abandonment helped preserve these items. It turned out that the bottle found on the beach had no connection to the crime and was mistakenly considered as evidence. Forensic psychiatric evaluation Sean Gowan blamed the voices in his head, which he claimed ordered him to commit acts of violence and asserted that he was not aware of his actions. His defense attorneys also insisted that Sean was mentally ill and unfit to stand trial. It was up to qualified psychiatrists to determine the truth of these claims. The evaluation revealed that the accused did indeed suffer from a range of mental disorders, exacerbated by the effects of alcohol and prohibited substances. However, at the time of the crime, he acted deliberately, carefully planning each step. Sean was fully aware of how to proceed and how to cover his tracks to avoid police detection. This was precisely why he first ended the life of the young man, knowing that if anything went awry, the woman would not be able to resist. For the same reason, he took the casings with him and prudently gave the rifle to his father, asking him to hide it. According to the psychiatrists, although Gallen had mental deviations, he was competent to stand trial and be held accountable for his actions. What was surprising in this complex case was that his parents, brother, and former girlfriend knew, or at least suspected, that he had committed the double homicide, yet none of them had turned him over to the police. Trial and Sentence The trial of the accused took place in the spring of 2019, nearly 15 years after the brutal act against the couple. On June 17th of that year, Sean Gallen was sentenced to two consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole, plus an additional 94 years for the end of his own brother's life in 2017. The convicted man is now serving his sentence in a special prison unit designated for particularly dangerous inmates with mental disorders. He continues to claim that he hears voices and behaves aggressively, hence he is kept under special surveillance to prevent him from harming himself or anyone else nearby. Lastly, it should be noted that the motive for the double homicide was never established. Sean simply saw the couple sleeping on the beach and decided to end their lives. July 28, 1996, was a normal summer day in South England. Captain John Kopik and his son readied themselves for a day of fishing on their Brixham trawler, Melcary. After a day of unsuccessful hauls, father and son ventured further into a place called The Roughs. After weighing down the med and tossing it overboard, they waited. Both men felt the familiar drag of a heavy catch. Kopik assumed they must have caught a big fish and decided it was time to bring the net back to the surface. However, it was not a fish. Scrummed, the men watched as the dead body of a man flopped onto their deck. 
Kopik immediately alerted the Brixham Coast Guard. The body was badly decomposed. It had been in the ocean for some time. It had been nibbled on by fish, but was impeccably dressed in a long sleeve shirt, corduroy pants, and brown shoes. Police noted that his pockets had been turned out. There was no identification on him. The only identifying features on the John Doe were a badly smudged tattoo on his right hand and a Rolex watch on his wrist. The body was transported to the medical examiner's office in Devon. The man was estimated to be between 40 and 50 years old. The tattoo looked like a cluster of stars. The only serious injury had been to his head. It was not fatal, and Matt, along with other bruising, seemed consistent with being dragged along the seabed before being pulled up into the boat. His lungs were filled with water. It was ruled a drowning, a common occurrence in the area given the English Channel was just off the coastline. Police believed he may have fallen overboard during one of the ferry crossings. The only other possible way forward was to identify him through dental records. If he was a British citizen, they'd be on record, and so the examiner did just that, but it would take a while. It was by chance a mortuary technician noticed the man's watch. It was a Rolex Oyster self-winding watch that was fully waterproof and required motion to remain active for 48 hours at a time. It was also possible to trace the ownership if it was an original. Examining the watch, investigators were able to determine that the man had drowned on July 20th, 1996, as the calendar feature showed the date July 22nd. They were also able to find a hidden serial number between the wristband and watch face. This number was sent off to Rolex to determine if it was an original and had been serviced by the owner. In the meantime, the John Doe was dubbed the Rolex Man, and the mystery deepened. Several weeks later, through records kept by Rolex, investigators received a name, Ronald Joseph Platt. The medical examiner also received the dental records to corroborate this evidence. Ronald Joseph Platt was a 51-year-old TV repairman. Records state that he was born in Calgary, Canada in 1945 before his family moved to Britain. He was unmarried and had once served as a soldier in the British Army as part of his national service. Close friends described him as a quiet and introverted man who had a passion for his native country, Canada. He was also interested in electronics and precision engineering, something which led to him buying a Rolex in Germany in 1967. It was one of his most prized possessions, and his ex-partners said Platt would not even take his watch off to shower. Using this information, investigators needed to find out exactly who Platt was and how he ended up tangled in a fishing trawler. Detective Constable Ian Clenahan of the Devon and Cornwall Police was assigned to the case from the initial discovery. Police were able to discover that Platt's last known address was in Essex, hundreds of miles from where his body was found. Clenahan made contact with the Essex Police Department. Detective Sergeant Peter Redman offered to visit the address to help with the case. When Redman visited the property, it was vacant. Redman contacted the landlord to explain that the owner had moved some time ago but provided the detective with a reference letter. The letter contained the forwarding address and contact number of one David Davis. Calling the number provided, Redman was able to reach out to Davis. The detective inquired about Clatt and Davis's relationship before explaining that the body they discovered in Devon was possibly that of his friend. Davis agreed to pay the Essex police a visit. Redman met with Davis and found him to be an amiable person who seemed quite confident. However, he was quiet and did not ask many questions about Platt's death or discovery. When prompted, Davis explained that he and Platt had been friends for several years. Davis told Redmond that he hadn't seen Platt in over three months. The last time they'd met, he'd loaned him money to start an electrical business in France. As far as Davis knew, Platt had been living in France all this time. During the interview, Redmond learned that the tattoo on Platt's hand was in fact a maple leaf, the national symbol of Canada. Davis explained Platt's love for the country. Having given all the information he could, Davis left the station, promising to send Detective Redman a photo of Platt. Days later, Redman received the photo as promised. Police in Essex were able to wrap up the investigation on their end, landing on the theory that Platt fell overboard and drowned along the channel. This fit the story told by Davis. It was just an unfortunate accident. 
As the Essex case wrapped up, Clenahan needed to tie up the loose end on his side. He tried contacting Davis several times, but was unsuccessful. He turned to his colleague Redman in Essex to help make contact with Davis. Agreeing to this, Redman paid Davis a visit at his home in Woodham Walter. It was a rural part of Essex with only four houses. These houses were not numbered traditionally, but rather each had a name. He knocked on the first door and an elderly couple answered. When they asked Redman who he was looking for, he gave them the name David Davis. The couple then informed him their neighbor was not Davis, but Ron Platt. They went on to describe Platt to Redman, and he realized that they were talking about the same man he had met with previously. Redman knew something was wrong here. He contacted Clenahan back in Devon and explained how, by sheer chance, he just unmasked another chapter to the story. Detectives from both counties now knew there was more to the story than met the eye. Redman started focusing on gathering information about the man who was posing as his dead friend. He revisited the elderly couple he came to know as Frank and Aubrey. They told him the tale of Ron Platt and his rather young wife and two little children. They also mentioned that Platt and his family had often vacationed in Devon as they had a yacht down there. The name, though, escaped them. In Devon, Clenahan too started re-examining the evidence and began by questioning old witnesses. His first stop was John Coppock. When questioned, Coppock told him that the neck dragged up a 10-pound anchor along with Platt's body. Coppock gave the anchor to a friend, who then gave it to his mother to sell. Fortunately, the anchor remained unsold, and investigators were able to retrieve and bag the anchor as evidence. For Clenahan, the next stop was interviewing those who knew Platt. He contacted Platt's brother, Brian, who told them about Elaine Boyes. Boyes was Platt's ex-partner. They'd been together for 13 years. Investigators paid Boyes a visit and discovered the connection between Platt and Davis. Boyes met Davis in 1991 while working as a receptionist at a fine arts auctioneer in Harrogate, England. She remembered Davis being tall, engaging, and charming. They spoke about Davis moving to Yorkshire and the topic veered toward employment. Davis wanted Boyas to work for his company. She explained that it wouldn't be for long, as she and Platt were planning on relocating to Canada. Charming his way in, Davis told Boyas that he could help her and Platt save up to make the move to Canada. It was not long before Boyas began working as an executive assistant for Davis. She then introduced Platt to Davis, and the two men developed a fast friendship. The couple were mesmerized by Davis's grandiose stories and admired his lavish lifestyle. Davis made them an offer to be directors of his company, the Cavendish Corporation. Initially, Boyas was hesitant about the offer. Davis explained his reasons for not wanting to have his name linked to the business. He alleged that his ex-wife was a wealthy doctor living in New York who still demanded he pay alimony. By now, the couple developed a trusting relationship with Davis and believed their friend was truly trying to keep his wife at bay. Davis had both Boyas and Platt traveling to Europe to broker deals for him and slowly pulled them into the web he was weaving. They deposited money for him into various foreign bank accounts, never questioning David or his motives. He was trustworthy, a man of religion, and in their eyes, infallible. On Christmas Day, 1992, Davis invited the couple to spend the day with them and his daughter, Noel. After enjoying the hearty meal, they sat down to exchange gifts. Boya's car was the ultimate gift. Davis had made a promise to buy the couple two tickets to Canada if they were willing to use them before February 1993. For Boya's, it seemed a bit overwhelming with a short notice, but Clatt was on Clab 9. His lifelong dream of returning to Canada was being realized thanks to this generous man he had come to call a true friend. Davis convinced them that it was better they get a start on their new life sooner than later. Davis wasted no time in preparing for their imminent departure. He suggested to both Boyas and Platt to have rubber stamps of their signatures made in case he needed to sign any documents urgently. He'd also keep their driver's licenses with him in case proof of identity was required. This didn't seem a tall order for the couple because they trusted Davis, saying he'd just given them the start they needed. And so, in February of 1993, Boyas and Platts jetted off to Canada to begin their new lives. Canada did not offer the greener grass that the couple had expected. They'd landed in the country in the middle of winter. 
Work was scarce, and financial troubles soon turned into relationship problems. Boyas and Claya tried to make it work, but the growing tension created a rift, and they soon drifted apart. Five months later, Boyas returned to England to attend her sister's wedding as a bridesmaid. She had no intention of returning to Canada. Having become family friends, Davis was also invited to the wedding. There, he spoke to Boyas and inquired after Plant. He was upset after hearing that Boyas was not returning to Canada and that she and Platt had ended their relationship. Davis tried convincing Boyas to give Platt in Canada a second chance. When she refused, Davis suddenly changed tactics. He soon packed up his life and family and left Boyas with a mobile number. Their friendship dissolved and soon the calls disappeared as well. Platt and Boyas too were no longer in contact. Since leaving Canada, She'd not had any contact with her ex-lover, Platt, or her once dear friend, Davis. So when Davis contacted Boyas late in 1996, she didn't think much of the impromptu conversation, as they barely had anything to say to each other after all that time. He mentioned nothing about Platt, and that was that. He failed to inform her that Platt was dead. After the interview was over, Boyas told police she now had her suspicions that Davis was somehow involved in Platt's death. Boyas provided the vital link between Davis and Platt, but investigators needed more definitive clues. They began talking to witnesses. After the wedding in Harrogate, Davis made a quick escape with his family to Devon. There, he began introducing himself as Ron Platt. His daughter was pregnant, and so he introduced people to her as his wife, sometimes calling her Elaine Boyas, other times Noel Platt. It was also coming knowledge that Davis owned a yacht. Adding further suspicion was that witnesses said they had seen Platt and Davis together a month before Platt's body was discovered. They'd allegedly booked into the Steam Packet Inn as brothers David and Ronald Platt. By now, police knew Davis was lying about Platt in his knowledge about his death. They needed a final bit of evidence, though. Looking into mobile records, Davis's numbers showed that calls had been made from the same area that the medical examiner estimated the drowning of Platt occurred. Essex police planned a sting operation to arrest Davis on suspicion of Platt's murder. They waited for him to arrive at the Chelmsford train station after being tipped off by Boyas, who agreed to meet Davis for coffee. He, however, evaded them. Redmond, though, was tenacious and decided to drive by the family home. There, he noticed activity, but he did not pounce immediately, calling for backup instead. There was the assumption that Davis might be armed. As they prepared to make their move, a taxi pulled up to the driveway and Davis made a quick getaway as the taxi sped off. Police gave chase and Davis was eventually apprehended. With a gun trained on him, Davis surrendered without incident. Little did police know this was only the tip of the iceberg. Davis was arrested and his fingerprints taken. Running them through an international database revealed another twist to an already thickening plot. The prints came back belonging to a man named Albert Johnson Walker. He was ranked number four on Interpol's wanted list and was Canada's most wanted fugitive. Walker's story begins in Canada six years before Platt's body was discovered in the Atlantic Ocean. Born in Hamilton, Ontario on August 9, 1945, Walker always dreamed big. He was a high school dropout with a larger-than-life presence. He worked as a bank teller and spent much of his free time socializing in Ontario. It was during a social event he met his ex-wife, Barbara MacDonald. After a whirlwind romance spanning all of four days, he proposed to her and they married in 1968. They started a family early, having three girls and four boys. They raised the family in Paris, Ontario. After years of helping other people with financial solutions, Walker started a freelance bookkeeping business with Barbara. Business thrived, and within 10 years, he was operating six branches, employing over 30 people. Friends eagerly invested with him. All the while, he was siphoning their money into offshore accounts in both the Cayman Islands and Switzerland. Soon, the cracks started to appear. His marriage broke down following his numerous affairs. The people he was stealing from started asking questions, and in 1990, Walker decided it was time to leave before it all blew up. Telling friends he was taking their then 15-year-old daughter, Sheena, for a skiing trip to Europe, he made his escape. 
Barbara realized what was going on and, fearing for her daughter's safety, declared her a missing person. Police were on his trail, but it abruptly ended in London. He adopted a new identity stolen from a client. He was now going by David Wallace Davis, and Sheena became Noel. Although he evaded authorities, the name David Davis still linked him back to his true identity. He needed to find a new identity, and the opportunity presented himself when he met Ronald Platt. Platt kept the very small circle of friends and was obsessed with living in Canada. Walker used this knowledge to his advantage. The wheels were in motion, and Walker finally had the identity he needed. But plans fell through when Platt contacted Walker in 1995. Life in Canada was not the dream he foresaw. He informed Walker that he was moving back to Essex to settle near Davis. The solid foundation Walker was curating started to, again, crack at the edges. Having two Ronald Platts in the same area with the same birth details was not going to work well for Walker. So he hatched a plan. Walker had purchased a yacht and named her Lady Jane. He had taken his family and Platt down to Totney's in Devon to celebrate the launch of the vessel. While there, the men purchased a new 10-pound anchor, which, ironically, became vital evidence in the investigation. After returning to Essex, Walker invited Plab for another weekend down in Devon, just two friends enjoying the coast and some fishing. Walker sailed the Lady Chang out into open water, a safe distance from any onlookers on shore. He then hipped Thad over the head with the anchor, knocking him unconscious. Walker rummaged through his pockets to remove any identification before securing the anchor to his belt and tossing him over to a water grave. It was the perfect murder. Except, Walker made one crucial mistake. He forgot to remove the Rolex that unraveled a finely executed plot to escape justice. Walker's trial began in 1998. Evidence presented to the court included the anchor that was discovered in the napt with Platt's body. Forensic experts were able to determine that the injury on Platt's head was consistent with the shape of the anchor. There were also traces of zinc bound on the belt of the pants that were consistent with zinc on the anchor. Walker weighed Platt down by securing it to his belt. A search of Lady Jane yielded more physical evidence. Hairs much of Platt were found on a cushion beyond. Platt's fingerprint was bound on the carrier bag used to carry the anchor back to Lady Chain. Blood was found near the rails. At his home, Walker's habit of courting did him in, as documents were confiscated and used to prove his bogus business enterprises and trail of deception. It was, however, the testimonies of both Boyes and Sheena that were to be the final nails in his coffin. Boya's testimony provided the court with evidence that Walker had much to lose if Ron Plack returned to England. Sheena, however, delivered the final blow. She was unable to provide a solid alibi for Walker on the weekend of the murder. She also confirmed he had been out on the yacht and looked disheveled and agitated when he returned late on the day of the murder. Sheena's testimony opened an entirely new chapter of the saga. She told the court of her life living in fear with her father his ability to charm, and how she felt as much of a victim as anyone else who crossed his path. When Walker took the stand, he presented a very charming persona to the court. He said that Sheena begged him to take her along. He admitted to fraud and to other crimes, but denied killing Platt. The blood found on the yacht was due to Platt bumping his head while they were out fishing, he said. Yet the jury saw through the lies and took just two hours to find him guilty. High Court Justice Neil Butterfield addressed Walker, stating, The killing was carefully planned and cunningly executed with chilling efficiency. You are a plausible, intelligent, and woofless man who poses a serious threat to anyone who stands in your way. He was sentenced to 15 years to life. In 2005, he was allowed to return to Canada to serve out a sentence. In 2007, aged 61, he was given an additional four years to run concurrently with his sentence. In 2015, he filed an application for parole, but withdrew it at the last moment. Now, at age 75, the Parole Board of Canada has denied him his freedom by revoking his application for day and full parole. He was also denied his request to go to Vancouver Island unaccompanied or a personal development program. It's likely he will never taste freedom again. Walker did, indeed, execute an almost perfect crime.
However, karma has a way of catching up. Had it not been for Rolla Platt's genuine Rolex and a string of events that occurred by sheer chance, he may have gotten away with it. 22-year-old Brandon Gonsalves lived with his small family in Goragayan West. Now Goragayan West was becoming crowded suburb in Mumbai City. Besides Gonsalves, his family only consisted of his mother and older sister. On December 19th, 2016, like every day, Gonsalves went for a morning walk from his home to Ari Colony. Usually, he would return home within an hour after his stroll, but today he didn't come back until afternoon. Concerned, Gonsalves' mother Seema and older sister Kashma first called his friends because he had left his phone at home today. Despite contacting some friends, they couldn't find any information about Gonsalves. Now, the sun had already set and night was slowly falling. Worried about their son, Seema took her daughter and went to the nearby Dindoshi police station to file a missing person report. Now, besides Gonsalves' family and friends, the police are also trying to find him. Meanwhile, the Dindoshi police station had distributed Gonsalves' photo to nearby police stations as well. However, amidst this, around 12.30 in the afternoon on December 22nd, a call comes to the nearby Airy police station. The caller reports that he has just seen a headless body. Upon hearing this, the police promptly rush to the reported location in Airy Colony. Upon arrival, the scene that it witnessed astonishes them. There, beneath a tree, lies a body without a head, neck, or clothes. And upon seeing it, it seemed as if someone had placed it there deliberately. Now witnessing this sight, the police cordoned off the area completely, not allowing any ordinary person to approach. Afterwards, the police began their investigation by first examining the area nearby. Just 20 meters away from the body, the police found the head and clothes stained with blood. Additionally, a few meters away from the body, the police also found some other items used in worship, such as a mirror, coconut, padukas, threads, turmeric powder, and kumkum powder, a.k.a. vermilion. Anyway, the police collected these items and sent the body to a nearby hospital for post-mortem. Subsequently, the files of missing persons were checked at the Ari police station, and the identification of this dead body was made with a boy named Brandon Gonsalves. As I mentioned earlier, the missing report of Brandon Gonsalves had been distributed to all nearby police stations by Dindoshi police. So now the Ari police confirmed that he was the same boy who had gone missing three days ago on December 19th. Well, now Gonsalves' family is also informed, and thus the missing case of Gonsalves turns into a murder case. After this, as far as I have read, perhaps the police had to form eight plus teams to search for Gonsalves' killer, including a special team from the crime branch. But seeing the body of her only son in this condition, Gonsalves' mother Seema and elder sister Kashma were both in a terrible state of distress. So much so that when Seema saw her son in this condition, she fainted upon seeing the body. However, the police quickly began their investigation to find the culprits. On the other hand, some shocking details emerged in Gonsalves' post-mortem report. The post-mortem report stated that Gonsalves' tongue, voiced box, skin from his right cheek, and even his entire neck were missing, with the neck bone intact. This means that someone had killed Gonsalves so brutally that even the small spine is fragment of our neck, the neck spine, was broken. All these things were horrifying the police because initially, the police thought this case seemed to be a result of personal rivalry, as if someone had killed Gonsalves to settle a score, but the police were soon to be proven wrong. Actually, according to the post-mortem report, it was found that Gonsalves' death occurred due to the separation of his head from his body. However, forensic pathologists also checked whether Gonsalves was given any drugs or substances before being killed, but nothing like that was found in any post-mortem report. After that, the police found out that Gonsalves was murdered three days before his body was found, between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. on the same day he went missing. Additionally, there were no signs of any fight, struggle, or injury on his body, indicating that Gonsalves didn't even try to save himself until his last breath. Furthermore, two marks were found on Gonsalves' body. Actually, there were two cross symbols on his forehead and right hand, 
which seemed to have been made with a sharp object. After learning about all these things, this case became even more intriguing for the police and investigators, because now there were a lot more questions in front of the police. Looking at Gonsalva's body, it seemed as if his body had been cut twice. First, his head was separated from his shoulders, and then later his neck was cut from the head. Additionally, forensic experts said that where Gonsalves' body was found, there was absolutely no evidence of his murder, if as not a single trace of blood was found there. So it was clear that Gonsalves was killed somewhere else, and then some parts of his body were removed to perform some rituals or something similar. Later, his body and clothes were thrown away in this deserted place. Here, when the police found the materials of worship and glass, coconuts, slippers, turmeric, and vermilion at the crime scene, for the first time, this case seems like a human sacrifice. After the possibility arose that Gonsalve might be taken to another location and harmed, the police began checking the CCTV cameras around the Ari colony. But first, they checked the CCTV cameras around his house. They saw Gonsalve leaving with his dog around 7 o'clock in the morning and returning after a morning walk within an hour. However, just 10 minutes later, Gonsalve left his house again, but this time with a bag. Now what was in that bag could not be determined because the bag itself was not found. But then, a little further from Gonsalves's house, the police spotted a white Audi car in another CCTV footage with two people inside a driver and a woman in a white Punjabi suit. It was shown in the CCTV that they were following Gonsalves slowly with their car. The woman wearing a white Punjabi suit is given directions to the driver, telling him to take the car in that direction. However, the police also questioned Gonsalves' family members to see if anyone might know that woman and driver, but the police didn't get any good response from there either. The police suspected that there might be more than two people in the car, and unfortunately, the day Gonsalves' body was found, the two CCTV cameras in that area were not working. This raised suspicion for the police that Gonsalves was abducted on December 19th in this same car and then murdered elsewhere, with his body being thrown in a deserted place in Airy Colony on the dark night or morning of December 22nd. But since then, investigators have felt that perhaps a local person might be involved in this murder case because the police checked 70-plus CCTV cameras in this entire case, but none of them recorded anything suspicious that would raise suspicion on any individual. The investigators clarified that perhaps the killers were aware of the location of every CCTV camera in the Airy colony. This helped them in escaping from the colony and Gorogayam. This clears one thing that the killer was someone who was well acquainted with Gorogayan and the colony, because an outsider couldn't have known every road in CCTV so well. The investigators explored all possible angles of Gonsalves's killing, such as a love affair angle, whether someone jealous killed Gonsalves, any personal rivalry, human sacrifice angle, robbery and property dispute. But the police never found any leads in any angle. Although for some time, the police kept the angle of human sacrifice on the table, and even questioned several tantrics, babas, and black magicians about the cut parts of the body, the mark of the cross on the forehead and the right hand, whether there was any connection between them or not. But the police didn't get any help from here either. Gonsalves was a middle-class boy who decided to graduate in arts. However, due to some reasons, he dropped out of college as well. His father had passed away three years ago, leaving Gonsalves in a state of depression for a long time. During the police investigation, Gonsalves' call records were also checked, but no suspicious numbers were found. In fact, Gonsalves rarely talked to anyone, except for his family, or perhaps three or four friends. But what intrigued the police in this case was finding a diary in Gonsalves' room. Within it were some sketches that further complicated this case. Actually, if these sketches are examined closely, it will be apparent that they tell the story of two sacrifices. In the first, a person is attempting to cut off an animal's head while wearing a suit. Meanwhile, in the second sacrifice, a man's head is being cut off with a saw. In addition to these, an attempt has been made to portray the SpongeBob cartoon character as a monster. Or on the other side of the page, a picture of a deer without a head has been drawn, and right next to it, only the head of a lion cub has been drawn. 
Furthermore, when the police went inside Don Salvez's house, they found a strange sign on a wall just behind the door, as if it were some sort of cult symbol. Now, what was even more surprising was that when the Mumbai police tried to recreate the crime scene with Gonsalves' dog, the startling thing was that Gonsalves' dog went straight to where Gonsalves' body was lying with a tree. After a while, his dog arrived at the spot where Gonsalves' body was found, just a few meters away. Among all the cases we've explained on this channel so far, this case was the weirdest, like how Gonsalves' dog somehow went to the places where his body was found. It's possible that when Gonsalves first went out for a walk with his dog on December 19th, he might have already gone to the place where his body was found. Another point is that the white Audi car following Gonsalves might have been known to him, and he might have gone with them willingly, sitting in the car. Additionally, it's possible that after returning home, Gonsalves took the bag with him, which might have contained items related to worship like coconut, paducas, etc. Because it's also being said on the internet that maybe Gonsalves sacrificed himself. Today, it's been over seven years since this case, but the murderer of Brandon Gonsalves is still unknown. Meanwhile, Gonsalves as his mother and sister have made numerous visits to the police station and the crime branch office to find out the status of their son Brandon Gonsalves' murder case. During this time, Gonsalves' mother and sister were afraid that the police might close Gonsalves' murder case. Due to this reason, Seema's elder daughter Kashma appealed to Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and the state's chief minister to seek justice. Well, if this case gets solved in the future, we will definitely update you through this channel's community post. But so far, this case remains unsolved. With this, Brandon Gonsalves' case also concludes here. Before moving forward, quickly subscribe to the channel. This is strange. You haven't subscribed to the channel yet. Quickly subscribe to it. Now, we are jumped to the next story. This is the story of Madanapalli City in the state of Andhra Pradesh, India which is Asia's largest tomato market. Besides, there are many mountains here as well. It was January 24th, 2021, around 8.30 p.m. on Sunday night in Madanapalli, when Dr. V. Purushotham Naidu, the head of the Naidu family, called his friend Raju and said on the phone, both my daughters are no longer in this world. Alekya, 27, and Saidivya, 22, have both passed away, but there's nothing to worry about. Tomorrow morning, they will come back through reincarnation because the Kalyug is ending and the Satyug will begin from tomorrow. Upon hearing this, Raju said to his friend, Dr. Naidu, everything is normal at home? Speaking such language against your daughters doesn't suit you. In response, Dr. Naidu said, no, Raju, I am telling the truth. In a while, both I and your sister-in-law will leave our bodies in Kalyug and be born again in Satyug. Upon hearing this, Dr. Nayadu's friend Raju started feeling extremely restless. Consequently, he abruptly ended the call and within a few minutes arrived at Dr. Nayadu's house. Raju reached there, knocked on the door, and just as the door was about to open, Dr. Nayadu himself appeared, looking completely normal. But when Raju went inside and saw the scene there, his eyes widened in shock because Dr. Nayadu had spoken the truth. Lying on the ground in the prayer room of his house was the lifeless body of his 27-year-old daughter, Alakia. She had completed her master's in Bhopal and now was preparing for the civil services. Her face was pale and blood was oozing from various places. After this, Dr. Nayadu took Raju to another room adjacent to the prayer room where the dead body of his 22-year-old daughter, Saidivya, lay on the ground. She had been struck with a trident of Lord Shiva on her forehead, and a small brass pot placed in the prayer room was inserted into her mouth. The clothes were removed from both bodies, and they were wrapped in red cloth. Additionally, their hair was partially cut, and they were placed in front of the statue of Lord Shiva in the temple. They had scattered many worship materials around the bodies. However, despite seeing the bodies of their daughters, there was no sign of tension or sorrow on the faces of Dr. Naidu and his wife Padmaja. This behavior of his friend and his wife seemed very strange to Raju, 
Therefore, he bids them goodbye and leaves their house. However, instead of going home, he goes straight to the police station and tells the police the whole story of how these educated parents sacrificed their daughters. He also informs them about the mental condition of Dr. Naidu and his wife. However, the police were didn't having little belief in Raju's story after hearing this strange tale. Because for the past year, Dr. Naidu and his family, who had been living in the new house in Madinapal, had earned quite a reputation in the city. Anyway, after that, the police station in charge, along with some officers, directly reached the Naidu family's house. When the police knocked on the door, once again it was Dr. Naidu who opened it. But seeing her husband's friend with him, Padmaja got very angry and started shouting at the police because they had once again disrupted their worship. Now, the argument between the police and the Naidu family had attracted neighbors from nearby. Now, as soon as the police entered the house and saw what was inside, they too were astonished. Later, after hearing Raju, the police realized that it was a case of superstition. Although Mr. and Mrs. Nayudu repeatedly tried to convince the police that both their daughters would return to life before sunrise tomorrow, they were just saying that they only need a day's time, and tomorrow morning both our daughters will come back to life, then you all will be surprised. But the police knew that both girls were dead, so how could they come back to life? Therefore, Mr. and Mrs. Nayudu were first explained with great difficulty. But when they still didn't understand, the police showed some firmness and took both of them to the police station. Afterwards, a forensic team was called in to investigate the crime scene. The forensic team continued their examination for some time and then sent the bodies for post-mortem. Now, the police have started investigating both inside and outside the house. Here, the police learned from neighbors of the Naidu family that someone from the family used to go out daily to buy something, but for the past three days, no one has come out of the house, nor has anyone gone inside, not even the maid who used to clean the house, as these people did not even call her. After that, the police directly approached the maid, who told them that three days ago, she was told by the Nayadus that we are going to perform a special worship in the house for three days, and until we call you, do not come to work at the house. On the other hand, upon checking both girls' social media profiles and bookshelves inside the house, the police found out that Alekia highly respects Indian philosopher Osho. On his social media posts, Osho's name appeared repeatedly, indicating that he was one of Alekia's favorite people. Additionally, beside Alekia's dead body, was a book by the spiritual guru Meher Baba. Besides, pictures of Shui Sai Baba, Meher Baba, and Osho were plastered all over their house. Furthermore, neighbors often heard prayers and tantric chants from their house, and several times they saw some swamis entering the house. On the other hand, what was surprising was that just a few days before the murder, Alekia posted twice on her Instagram. In one post, she wrote, work is done, and in the second post, Shiva is coming. Well, only Dr. Nayudu and Padmaja, who were present in the custody, could reveal the truth behind this. However, controlling Padmaja was proving to be extremely difficult for the police. But before the custody, when the police were taking both husband and wife for a COVID test, Padmaja started saying, I am Shiva myself. Because of my body particles, COVID has spread everywhere. It did not come from China. I do not give it up to Shiva from the world. After getting their COVID tests done, Dr. Naidu informed the police about his background. Actually, Dr. Naidu had a master's in philosophy and science. In addition, he had obtained a PhD and was currently a professor of chemistry at Government Degree College for Women, Nada Nepali. His wife, Padmaja, was a gold medalist in mathematics and had been teaching at the famous schools of Nada Nepal for nearly 23 years, including at Masterminds IIT Talent High School. Alongside, she also had a master's in science. Additionally, Alekia, 27, was a postgraduate from Popal and then an aspirant for civil services. 
Furthermore, Saidivya, a 22-year-old, was training at the A.R. Rahma Music Conservatory in Mumbai after completing her Bachelor of Business Administration course. However, due to the lockdown, both of them had to return home. You might also wonder why, with such educated family members, these individuals attempted suicide. You'll find the answer by the end of the video. Afterwards, Alakia picked up Lord Shiva's trident from the temple and thrust it into her sister Divya's forehead. Then a copper vessel was placed in her mouth. Following the death of her younger sister Divya, Alakia told her mother that now she had to kill her. As a result, Padmarja struck Alakia on the head with a dumbbell kept in the house. Consequently, Alakia also died shortly thereafter. After killing both their daughters, both the husband and wife wandered around their bodies for quite some time. Now, because of the insistence of the wife and daughter, it was Dr. Nayudu's turn. Perhaps out of fear, he called his friend and told him the whole matter, and if he hadn't made that call, perhaps neither of them would be in this world today. However, due to this, Padmaja scolded her husband, Dr. Nayudu, a lot, saying, you are a coward because of you, our secret got out and our daughters couldn't come back. After seeing all this, it was finalized in this case that due to mental illness, all these family members had planned this, and it was revealed from a psychiatrist's source that their entire family was dealing with a rare disorder called shared psychotic disorder. Actually, in this disorder, more than two people who are in close relationships have a similar way of thinking. And it's because of this disorder that Alakia and Saidivya are no longer in this world today. In this double murder case, Alakia had a Canadian friend who told the print media that he couldn't believe for many days that Alakia could do such a thing. After questioning on Monday evening, funeral of both these girls were performed, and permission for this was given only to Dr. Nayudu, while the girl's mother, Padmaja, was not allowed to participate for some reasons. In my opinion, in this case, Saidivya and Dr. Purushottam Nayudu seem innocent to me. Although if they hadn't fallen into the temptation of Alekia and Padmaja, perhaps this would have been a happy family today. So with this, the case comes to an end here. Friends, how did you like this combined cases? Do you want to see such combined cases in the future too? Please share your opinion in the comment box. If you appreciate our efforts, like and share this video, if you haven't subscribed, do so now.